The Rocky Horror Picture Show is known as THE cult classic movie. Its influence on pop culture, cinema, music, and fashion is undeniable. There's truly never been anything quite like it, and there never will be again. The film beckons with its sexual freedom, gender-bending dynamics, and punk rock attitude. It's no wonder a teenage me would fall head over high heels in love with it, sneaking out every Saturday night to see the local shadow cast back in Phoenix, Arizona, and eventually joining said shadow cast. And I was obsessed. My first email address and AIM screen name, well, that's like what we elder millennials used to call DMs, was regular Frankie Fan 86. I've seen the film at least 150 times. I've sung Sweet Transvestite probably just as many while working at a West Village piano bar, and even almost named this podcast the Ricky Horror Podcast Show instead of Rick or Treat, but opted not to in order to avoid a cease and desist. Needless to say, I love this movie as so many people do. And the wonderful thing about this movie is that it means something different to everyone who loves it. Its subversive and queer nature attracts those who feel marginalized or unwelcome, the weirdos, the freaks, misfits, and losers, giving them a safe place to do the time warp again and again and again. My guest in today's episode was a member of the legendary, iconic 8th Street Playhouse Shadowcast here in New York City in the 80s. Rather than spending the entire episode talking about this movie scene by scene like I usually do, I thought it would be fun to talk about our experiences with the film, our Shadowcast days, and what it all means to us. I think I've decided to make the Ricky Horror Podcast Show an annual October affair because, honestly, there are just so many stories to tell about this movie. I also wanted to mention, my guest and I do open up a conversation about gender identity and fluidity, and while we are obviously both in full support of any and all gender identities, we are also cis, albeit queer, people. And we want to make it perfectly clear that if there's any room for education for us, we are certainly open to it. That's the great thing about Rocky. It pushes boundaries, breaks barriers, and certainly got a conversation started back when it was first released in 1975. So, without any further hoopla, I present to you the one, the only, the original Rocky Horror Picture Show. So glad you joined us at the Rick or Treat Horror Cast. I'm your host, Ricky J. Duarte, and I'm joined by a very wonderful and dear friend of mine, Roberta Lip. Say hi, Roberta. Hi, Roberta. Oh, <laughs> I'm already being hilarious. You are hilarious. Hi, Ricky. Hi. Hello, people. I'm so glad you're here. <laughs> it's um, really great to do this. It's You were just top of my list to talk about one of both of our favorite films, the Rocky Horror Picture Show, for many reasons. Um, Roberta and I met working at a famed piano bar in downtown New York that shall go nameless because there are already far too many tourists there. Too many there. people. <laughs> <laughs> um, That's but hilarious. I worked there for many, many years, and Roberta and I formed a friendship over these many years. Uh, and one of the things that we found that we had in common was our love of Rocky Horror. It's true. It's true. I'm apparently in the legend category of, like, when I was there, which is ridiculous. But, um, and I, and when I was there, I was always told, oh, you missed the best times. But I was, I was really right there for, like, some great peak stuff. Sure. Uh, 80, let's say 83 to 84. 
five, I think, is when I was 1900 and. <laughs> uh, just for reference, for context. Um, but yeah, so it was uh, it was fun. That's so amazing to me. What a time to see New York. And you now you grew up in New Jersey. You grew up right across the river, correct? So you're in New yeah. York. I mean, you, you grew up in New York. And um, well, Roberta and I, so at this piano bar, kind of my signature song uh, was Sweet Transvestite. Uh, and you and I had been, you know, talking and getting to know each other for a while before you divulged in me your participation in the Rocky Horror community for so many years. How did, I would love to know, how did you get started with Rocky Horror? What was your, what, let's say this, what is the first time you remember seeing Rocky? Uh, well, I remember the first time for sure, but I want to, I want to rewind it to how long I wanted to see it. Um, so I remember kind of hearing about it. I don't remember the first time I heard about it, but then I saw fame in the movies, on the big screen, in the ninth grade, with my mom. And there is a sequence in fame, if you don't know the film, uh, where they all go to Rocky Horror. And it's at the 8th Street Playhouse, and it was filmed, you know, at the 8th Street. I mean, they just... They brought a crew in, from what I understand. Uh, you know, it was it was the real place, at the real time. Uncle Sal, Sal Piero, uh, the, the head of the national, whatever, uh, international maybe even, uh, Rocky Horror Fan Club for so many years, was, was up front emceeing. Anyway, whatever, I saw that and I went, oh, whatever that is, I want it. Like, I, I, I don't even, I don't know. It just called to every part of me. There's this performance aspect. There's I don't even know. I don't even know what I was looking at, but I was like, what? I whatever it is. I've never seen anything like it. I want that. So I always had a goal of getting to Rocky Horror and of um, and the Eighth Street Playhouse specifically. Now you give me way too much credit. I was a bit way across the <laughs> the, the river from New York. I was in the suburbs. Okay. I was definitely in the suburbs. Um, we drove cars. That's, you know, so I actually lived Got in a it. town with a train station. <laughs> this this didn't, this isn't where it started, but I, you know, I lived in a town with a train station and I could get to the city, but I couldn't get home at, 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 at a Rocky Horror hour. So we were car, car people for all of this. So the first time I saw it was uh, a year or two after that, I feel I'm not, I don't remember, somewhere in my, I have it written down somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> I used to write down when I went, oh, like, wow. who I went with, what I wore. I had a whole thing. That's amazing. How, how yeah. many times do you think you've seen this movie? Because I have my general number. Honestly, probably just a few hundred. Yeah. Two, three, I don't even, I, st I don't know. Same. I mean, I... I I'm going to say 150 to 200 times for me, definitely. Yeah, I never, and for me, that was, that quickly came, became, once I was a performer with the show, I, <laughs> that became an embarrassingly low number, in fact, so it's, it's, <laughs> I so, know, yeah. It, uh, you will hear me reference many times and many ways, what a pack of high school wolves Oh my God, was. it's so oh, yeah. catty, it's so oh. catty, I know, and I was so part of mean. it. I was part of it, and I... I, I was wasn't part of it. also, you know, it was because I, well, we'll get to my story. We'll get to my story. Keep going with yours. No, so the first time I, so uh, somewhere in, in high school, so ninth grade wasn't high school technically in my town, right? Okay. It was split, it was split between ninth and tenth. Uh, so once I was in high school, I had friends and they had the album and then we would listen to the album and we would sort of act it out even though I hadn't seen it and I was just like getting hungrier and hungrier and hungrier, but you had to like arrange it because of this car issue right. <laughs> because of this New Jersey aspect of it um, but finally a bunch of us went uh, oh my god my mom came with us my mom was with me the first time that's amazing my mom came yeah. once too yeah she she drove uh, wow. a bunch of us went and to the Teaneck Theater again New Jersey um, and I, I don't remember anything about it except I just got this flash of sitting next to my mother I don't remember anything about it except I was in. Yeah. I was in. And I had already heard too much about 8th Street, for, again, from these friends and the, the quality of performance there that this all looked like New Jersey to me. Okay. It was probably great. <laughs> you know what I mean? 
I think it was also oversold, perhaps mm. a little bit. The quality of the, I mean, what what they said was the, and you know the the person playing Frank looks exactly like you, like she was right here in front of me, and I couldn't tell the difference. And honestly, that's not common. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah. that's what I was expecting, you know? Sure. Um, but I think I saw it three times in New Jersey, and the third time I was like, no, no, I'm done. Okay. And what, however we arranged it, again, I don't have all the details anymore, um, but but we, ended up, we finally went to 8th Street, and everything about the 8th Street Playhouse was magical. Um, it, it didn't feel like a normal movie theater, you had to buy the tickets way in advance. You had to, you know, wow. get, on, get on. Yeah, oh yeah, you had to buy the tickets hours in advance. Many hours. It would sell out. It was a packed, sold out every Friday and Saturday night at midnight. Every Friday and Saturday night at midnight, packed and sold out. That's amazing. The A Street Playhouse is no longer there for anybody who doesn't know. Uh, Rocky originated the midnight showings were at the Waverly, the very first. Yeah. Again, these are the years that I heard I missed. <laughs> I missed the best times was right. the Waverly. Then it moved to A Street Playhouse. Um, so, again, everything about it was magical. I, I'd never seen a theater that looked like this. It was like a, you know, it was like a city theater. It was like a devoted one, one screen theater. Yeah. And that it had the uh, the neon. There was these sort of neon installations on on each wall to the right and to the left, about the first third of the way up from the screen to, you know, and it just, it, it just was this magical place Ugh. and everybody was a freak, yeah. you know, and it was packed with freaks. Well, you say the imagery of it, like just called to you and I really believe that it hits a certain kind of person and you know, you, you, it strikes you and it inspires you, you relate to it somehow, you know, because it, it's it particularly, you know, when it first came out and over the years and up until maybe recently, this was imagery that was not commonly portrayed. These were types of characters that were not commonly portrayed. Your freaks is the right word, and it's not one that would be used today. They wouldn't be calling Janet a slut either, but she right. is, and we all know it. <laughs> she is. <laughs> She's gotten worse over time, <laughs> as we know. As we know. <laughs> she who shall not be named. <laughs> she who shall not be named. Uh, yeah, it, uh, it, it, I, I firmly, the first time I remember anything was the VH1 Rocky Horror Weekend. Uh, I think that was maybe the 25th anniversary, if I'm not mistaken. And it was a whole weekend. There was a convention. They were showing the movie on VH1 again and again. There were costume contests and hosts. And uh, it was, I, I think I had seen pictures or clips before, but this was my first introduction. And I didn't get to see the whole film. My dad walked in and said, do you like this shit? And of course, I had to turn it off. I lived in a very uh -huh. homophobic home, for those who don't know. Um... And it actually wasn't until I started sneaking out on Saturday nights in Phoenix, Arizona to go to the show with my friends, my theater, you know, high school theater friends, uh, where I got to experience the film in its entirety, which was pretty cool to get to see it like you for the first time in full in an audience participation, in a shadow cast setting. Uh, yeah. And I would sneak out. I started dressing up. I started making friends with people uh, in the cast. And uh, the, my dad, it kind of comes full circle. I had a truck at the time. And I drove home. And it's like 3 in the morning. And I open my bedroom window to sneak back in. And I sling my heels in first. And then oh my god, that's perfect. I crawl <laughs> in and I've got a wig on and I've got Frank makeup on and my dad turns on the bedroom light and he'd been waiting for me. And that's how he caught me, <laughs> climbing in the window. Uh, and I told him I would stop going, but I didn't. And then he snuck into my truck and found Rocky Horror Picture Show, like, condoms. And, you know, <laughs> we yeah, the, the our cast used to give out condoms and... Um, and flyers and and all kinds of stuff and I I think he just had to let it go you know <laughs> I think he just and then it was after high school actually that I actually joined up with the cast mm. uh, and we'll talk about that pretty soon uh, in case you haven't noticed this is not a usual format for Rick or Treat Horror Cast uh, we are instead of going beat by beat with this film we're kind of worshiping it a little bit uh, we're admiring it a we're, little bit a little bit we're talking about yeah. what it means to us and society and its impressions. 
for sure. We'll also talk about our favorite moments, obviously. Uh, but now, Roberta, you have a really cool connection that is like recorded in history uh, with the Rocky Harp cast participation album. Tell us all about it. We really did do that. Um, <laughs> I think I think I wasn't a cast member yet, so part of. So I get to 8th Street, by the way, and then and then I'm in love with it, and then I'm like, I'm never going back to New Jersey. And then now all I want, I was like, I need to get in with these people, whatever that meant to me. It wasn't the most mature way of thinking, but that was it. That was always how I thought about it. And I wasn't wrong, because how you became a cast member at that time under that regime <laughs> was you got in, People knew you, and then you had a great costume. And unlike the scene in Fame, where people were in costume all through the audience, mm -hmm. and and that might be true for the audience. Part that's totally true for the audience participate. Oh, that was my audition. <laughs> that's what happened. Really? That was the only time we were allowed to come in costume. Wow. So, no, no, that was a different one. That's the photo. Okay, that's the photograph. Uh, the photograph on the inside cover. Where like, you're oh, dressed as magenta, right? I think you showed it to or, me. Where I'm dressed as magenta. Great. That was my quote unquote audition. That's all you had to do at the time was be liked, have a good costume, and be next. Yeah. <laughs> and um, so all the all the reverence people might have for what that cast was, it was all hierarchy <laughs> and nothing else. Sure. Um, and I... I you know, and I was good. Like, they didn't know if I was gonna be good or not. They didn't, not everybody was. It, it like I said, didn't sort of matter. Um, yeah. It's not as easy as people think it is because you can't make free choices. You are doing what's on a screen behind you. <laughs> right, and yet you have to generate something. Yeah. And you have to, it's sort of like, I guess it's like, it's sort of like a great lip sync, but it's, it's different than a great lip sync. I don't know, it's its own thing. Yeah. It's its own thing, That's for sure. There's nothing else like it. It's very specific. Um, there was a movie that came out in the 80s that uh, 80s people would remember, but uh, called Bachelor Party, right? That was Tom Hanks. It was sort of Tom Hanks transitioning from Bosom Buddies Tom Hanks to who he ends up being, but he's still that more Bosom Buddies. Anyway, there's a scene in it. Silly, fun, probably unbelievably disgusting movie in, in today's terms. Of course. Because it kind of always was. Of course. But there's a scene toward the end where uh, they there's like a run, a chase, a something, and people are chasing each other, and they go through a movie theater, and they end up going in front of the screen and sort of what they're doing just coincidentally mimics what's happening on the screen. Oh, that's funny. And I, oh, I always used to reference it as like, if you want to know what Rocky Horror is like, at least that aspect of it, that's, that's what you can look at that, and that's what it looks like. Sure. But again, nothing. Nobody had ever seen anything like that. You're acting it out in front of the screen. What? Yeah. Sometimes in the aisles. Okay. What? Lots of aisle. <laughs> yeah, lots of aisle work in in our production for sure. Um, you might have asked me a question and I might not have answered it. Oh, the. The audience purchase so yeah so event so yeah so uh so I wasn't a cast member yet uh but I was a regular so I got invited and we all had to be there by the way all of this was with my sister my sister and I were kind of like a, a pair at the at that time very much going she's the one with the car <laughs> right um so we were we were the lip sisters which by the way great fucking name perfect for Rocky Horror fans. absolutely <laughs> um. <laughs> And that was just a blurry, I don't even remember. So it was on a, it was 11 a.m. on a Saturday. Uh, and we had all been to Rocky the night before. And, you know, it, it's like, you know, when you know people from a bar and then you see them outside the bar. And yeah. it's like, I've never seen these people before in daylight, much yeah. less 11 a.m. It's too the early next for Rocky. <laughs> totally on a Saturday. But, I mean, it was mostly just arduous. Uh, we, we all sat, it was a recording studio, but it was, it was like a theater full. Like, we, there was enough of us to really sit and fill half a theater or a theater or something. And all the lines, uh, you know, were orchestrated 
but you still wanted them to sort of sound, sound natural-ish. But, you know, so we just did a bunch of takes of say it, for example. Right, right. <laughs> See how well that goes. No, but, it, you know, but the kind of slut and asshole and all those lines. Um, and I think that they come, they did, and we were in that studio for six hours. Wow. Now, were we they were, filming the, were they showing the film on the screen as well? Or was it just you all? Um, I think it was all script. Wow. And then there was another night it all blends together for me sure all of the nights people I mean out of different anniversaries different special nights we had stars who came to the theater it all blends together for me um, and not for a lot of other people it's me it's I you know I, I'm still in touch with many people and they're like don't you remember that I'm like uh, we did he met we met him I, you know like it's it's bad um, it wasn't even drugs it's just age um, <laughs> and my brain, my ADHD brain. Uh, but there was a night where they also did a live uh, recording at the theater. Okay. And I, I believe that what's on the album is is a blend. Okay. Of live and not live. And I think you can hear me and my sister. Uh, I think we say describe no. So there was Describe a cast your balls. member. No, there was a cast member who was a dear friend who I'm not going to just cuz sure. he's been very disappeared over the years, but his mm-hmm. last name was Colgate and I think we got in a line for him. I, I should have prepped this. I should have asked my sister cuz she would remember exactly what it was or listened, but it uh where it's you uh you can glisten and gleam and it's what's your favorite toothpaste gleam mm-hmm. and i think we got in mine's colgate okay if that's if that's in there that's us if not ah, i have to check we definitely got a line in that was just the two of us that's cool so yeah wow it, there's so many great callbacks do you have a favorite callback for the show it's and they're different region to region too i love that everywhere you go see a rocky show it's going to be a little different it's region to region and it's cast to cast It's well, it's also year to it's also era to era Mm -hmm. because sort of, sort of like, sort of like a Godspell revival. Like the jokes need to, you know, some of the the, there's new jokes that come in because they're relevant. You want to put in because they're relevant. So every once in I haven't been in a very long time, but anytime I ever go, there's new lines. Uh, Do I have a favorite? I mean, it was it was that stuff, it was the stuff where you could get in your own, your own thing, your own inside, whatever. I mean, it was, it was. You know, from just let there be lips. I yeah. think my sister and I had a little, and there were. So I don't remember, but like we had a little yay to that, and I can't remember what we said. Uh, I don't. Other than that, it was those little things. It was uh, like my friend Maria, who is the Columbia in the front row, toward the left on the album. Uh, she's a legend, a real one. Wow. And she. Uh, she had a, it was bump, da da, peanut, butter, deltoid. Uh, <laughs> I mean, and you, when you can musically backtrack that to hit that, I yeah. love that shit. Yeah, totally. Totally. It, um, some of my favorite callbacks have to do with Columbia. Just during her tap dance, like the uh, two, four, six, eight, show us how you masturbate. It just, yeah. it, it's just so funny. I think I have a couple favorites. Uh, wait, wait, stop. I just have to say hi to Renfield. Oh, so this Ricky is, my is cat. with Kat right now. Hi. Look at him. <gasps> Hello, Renfield. He's so Hello, beautiful. He's so obnoxious. If I don't let him in the room while I record, he screams at me. He's like Rum Tum Tugger. He's always on the wrong side of every door. <laughs> <laughs> so he has so to I'm be not in the even, room. I'm not even gonna say Maggie's name Uh-oh. any louder than that because no. right now she's not everywhere in my face. Right. <laughs> and she will be. Speak of the devil, and there she'll come. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, it's going to be dinner time. And yeah, anyway. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, you know, you mentioned your mom went with you. My mom, I have a really wonderful memory of my mom going to Rocky. She knew, my brother and I were both cast members. We were both obsessed with it, so much like the Lip Sisters. We were we were known as the Duarte Brothers. We had an opening uh, act, like an opening number. We would do where... Um, 
I would be Frank and he would be Brad and I would sing Does Your Mother Know That You're Out and it <laughs> shit got really weird for two brothers performing <laughs> that sure, song sure, sure. as Rocky as, as Brad <laughs> and Frank uh, but uh, my mom I really always felt that as conservative as she was at times in her life if she had grown up and been able to be a little freer mm. she would have been you know and I just took her to the show I think she'd probably seen the movie once many years before uh, and she knew what was going what was going to happen she knew what a shadow cast was she you know she didn't live under a rock um, and it she was taken on stage for the Virgin Sacrifice. For those who don't know, the first time you go to a Rocky show, at least the way we did it, uh, you stand in line to go in, and if you've never seen it before, they take lipstick, red lipstick, and put a V on your forehead. So you oh are <laughs> marked a virgin. And before, there's a whole pre-show. You know, there was dancing on stage. Everyone got up and danced and had fun. And then a whole pre-show, and then the Virgin Sacrifice, where virgins were brought on stage. And there was either a game or some kind of stunt that they had to to do and it was obviously always sexual in nature and my mom being you know in her 50s and very clearly not like the other people that were in the room was of course selected to do a stunt and to preserve her memory I won't go into detail but it involved a strapping young man and a tea bag and oh, oh she my did it she did it and you know what she got off that stage and she came and sat down and she had a smile on her face and she had a she had a great time she laughed and just was looking. I mean, she really enjoyed it. You know, she really enjoyed the theater in general. And after she passed, I was no longer a member of the cast, but she had become such a legend because of just what she what she did on that stage that, mm. um, you know, I, I lived out of state at the time when they did this. But when the cast found out, they had like a little moment of silence for her because she was like a legendary Virgin Sacrifice at the Rocky Horror Picture Show, the Broadway Bound and Gag cast in Phoenix, Arizona. That's beautiful. Yeah, you know, toward the end of, of her life, she she really opened up and changed a lot. And, um, you know, it, I'm a gay man, my brother's bisexual, and she loved her children. And she tried her best to wrap, a, wrap her head around what this meant. And if she couldn't wrap her head around it, she wrapped her heart around it, for sure. Mm. Uh but so after a show we would always go to Denny's I remember that uh, just makeup melting and wait so you were a magenta what uh, did I you was. did you play anyone else I didn't I think we did a drag night where I came as Krim one night mm -hmm. uh, I, I've ne that's really funny it just came up in conversation that I was gonna say I've never I've never um, so I'm a queer woman who leans toward men sure and i'm female presenting and female everything and i realized i was just contemplating this the other day and re reflecting on the criminologist moment because uh because halloween's coming up and we were talking about costumes and my dear friend george is talking about doing a what they were in the shadows thing and i was like oh i could be guillermo and like the same feelings came up of like ooh, i'm not comfortable I, I I always feel like I have to prove my femininity as a fat woman hmm. always At my you know yeah my identity so so the idea of dragging as a man is is a little confronting for me I'm just you're welcome I just threw all that into this but no you know what thank yeah, you for that. that it's because I'm an overweight man who has man boobs basically I oftentimes feel uncomfortable if I'm going to present in drag because I don't have to have padding <laughs> you know mm. and I'm not you know I'm not even that overweight it's just it's um you, you know it is it, but you know it's not the same comparison but thanks for sharing that you know yeah no it's it's you're welcome it's such an interesting <laughs> we're in such an interesting moment um for the conversation of of fluidity, yeah, and and you know everybody else is doing the hard work to look. So I, you know, when I was thinking about this the other night, I, I was like, oh, check that out. Look at that. That's been there all this time, and it's there now. Anyway, back to so yes, I only ever played magenta. I became the Friday night magenta in the cast, um, and. Uh, there wasn't no I guess there was there were people that changed I just never thought about 
again, a lot has changed, I would say. The many magentas were played by fat women. Mm-hmm. And mostly there was no other place for fat women. Okay. So I didn't even consider. Like recently, a few years ago, somebody, uh, a mutual friend of ours, said something to me about, oh, I, I see you as a, uh, really? I see you as a Columbia. And I was like, what? And I, for shits and giggles, did up my makeup as Columbia. And I was like, oh, I can see it. Yeah. But I would never consider putting my body into that person. Interesting. <laughs> well, you have the bubbly personality, you know? You, I'm a little you, squeaky. A little squeaky. <laughs> <laughs> it, um, that's, that's a real shame because Rocky should be all encompassing. You know, it, the, the movie is truly about two outsiders finding who they are, you know, in this weird world of freaks. And I would hope that, you know, that the casting would have embraced that as well. What an interesting, I never thought of Brad and Janet as the outsiders because they're the normies. Sure. So I never, I never, I never oh, even put it that way. It's so great. considering, well, I guess in the world of the film where the majority yeah, of the totally. characters are Transylvanians, you know, uh, it's well, you know, you, you, we were, we're talking about gender fluidity or gender feelings about gender identity. Why don't we talk about the film's representation of it? And I mean, for the film was 1974, correct? Now, I think five. 75. I think um, five. Yeah, yeah, definitely five. Anniversaries. This was I can not do that. a time when films showcased this in the least. It was obviously um, a stage musical first. The Rocky Horror Show opened in London and then transferred to New York uh, and turned into a film. The film was shot in England at um, one of the famous, well, on a studio, and then one of the famous castles that were in all of the old Hammer horror films as well. Mm. And they used a lot of props from the old Vincent Price movies, too, which I always thought was really cool. Oh, that's um, cool. Yeah, yeah. Uh, directed by Jim Sharman. The screenplay is by Richard O'Brien and Jim Sharman. Richard O'Brien, of course, penned the play uh, and plays Riff Raff. Uh, produced by Lou Adler and Michael White. I only know because I have the opening credits completely memorized. <laughs> I, I mean, I met a lot of these guys because really? not only did I do those events, what I, what, but I was part of the 10th anniversary at the Beacon Theater. Oh, and my God. And that was a big fucking deal. The Beacon, and that, I how retired cool. right after that. Um, yeah, it was very, very cool. I mean, I, 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 I met Richard O'Brien. I met, you know, we, I did a lot. It was That's a whole other thing. And there's almost no evidence <laughs> that I was at that. There's some pictures and there's some film stuff and I'm mostly cut out of it and not deliberately just cause. Listen, I was trying to find pictures of my shadow cast days and I don't think I have any. This was before Facebook and Instagram. And I mean, I need to really reach out to some, I mean, I don't really, I'm not in contact with a lot of cast members anymore, but I just need to see if anybody has anything. Cause it's, it's kind of devastating. It's such a huge, important part of my development you know, mm. as a person and sexually and socially, you know, and it, I I don't have anything from it. No costumes left. I might have a pair of trans leggings from my Transylvanian when I would be a Transylvanian somewhere. For the 10th anniversary, it was a whole uh, musical night. Coordinate like there were musical numbers. There was a band. I <laughs> this is what I always and whenever I play two truths and a lie, one of one of my truths is I sang backup for Meatloaf. What? Because I did. I was one of the backup singers for this whole event. Oh my god, that's amazing! And like to say that sounds amazing, right? It sounds like the most amazing thing, and I did. Um, I, 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 but anyway, there there um, we. We did Little Black Dress from Shock Treatment. I love Shock the, Treatment. I love that number. It's a great number. Uh, it's a great number. And I think they wrote, a, I think Richard wrote a verse for it, mm -hmm. a new verse for it, for that, for, I mean, maybe even a few, but definitely I think, I think we sang a verse that was like from the fans cool. or something. I don't, again, all lost to okay. me. I, it, it exists somewhere. Um, but but uh, there was a piece, there was a, black glittery fabric that I think his wife did the cutting and was handing us out different pieces of it and I still have a scarf a scarf my my piece from that I Maybe. still have it 
I still, yeah, that's probably all I still have. I don't know what happened to that costume. Yeah, I've moved so many times. I just, I can't take everything with me. And, oh, it's, it's a real shame. Um, but if we're, you know, talking about sexuality and for 1975 and what it represents then, you know, things have changed. There are more definitions these days than what this film might showcase, but also, I mean, at its core, this film is about sexual freedom. You know, give yourself over to absolute pleasure. And that's one of my favorite quotes, don't dream it, be it, is Mm -hmm. what I always took from this because Frank, growing up and wanting to be Faye Ray, you know, for, for my head to try to wrap around what that meant. And then to Frank not be the stereotype of what you would think this character would be, right? Because Frank is mask presenting and femme presenting and queer and bi and straight and he's just sex, you know? He's and He's just sex. He's just sex and he's sexy. Tim Kerr, I mean, no one could have played him but Tim Curry and thank God that he did and he, you know, continued from the stage show uh, to the film. It's, you know, he had such a, he kind of shied away from it after for many many years yeah uh trying to distance himself and i'm so grateful that in recent years he has reclaimed it you know so for that 10th anniversary i i I didn't even think about that that's what there is to talk about (laughs) there was so there's stories around it that 10th anniversary a lot of folks from the film were part of it uh she who shall not be named uh (laughs) she was there she definitely wow. showed up at this. The, we had a rehearsal the day before in a recording in a studio. Yeah. And I, she might have shown up for that. She might have been there. Uh, Bostwick was there. Uh, a lot. A lot of people were there. And Tim was supposed to be there. They told us that Tim was supposed to be there, and at the last minute, he couldn't be there. Uh. I never believed that he was supposed to be there. Yeah. However, this was so. This is Halloween ish, right around there of 1985. That's why I know it was a 75 film. Got it. And um, in January of 1986, I went to London. Uh, that's where I saw a little show called Les Miserables before it came here and before there was a Les Mis. Oh, wow. Um, I was on a theater trip. I saw something like 10 shows, including my professor who organized that theater trip surprised me with that our first night, our first show was Love... Love for Love, I think. Love Love for Love, which is a restoration comedy, and it was starring Tim Curry. Oh, my God. She literally surprised me with this because everybody knew. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and, my, what a secret to keep. <laughs> yeah. So I did the stage door thing, and I remember because that was the that was the reputation, right, that he was really trying to distance himself. Yeah. And I remember hearing different people tell stories of, I went to London, and I did a... I, I, I did the stage door thing and I sort of, I was like, I loved you in Amadeus or whatever. Right. And I was like, there I was, my version of, of 1986 punk. I think, I think I had like a semi mohawk and some of it was pink. Cool. Um, and I was like, I'm not going to fool anybody. Like who, he's not going to buy it. Yeah. So I was just like, I waited and we waited. I had a couple friends waited with me. We waited, we waited, we waited, we waited, we waited. And he finally came out and I just put my hand out. I said, you know, my name's Roberta. I was one of the performers at the 10th anniversary at the Beacon. We really missed you. He's like, oh, I'm so, I know. I really wanted to be there. And he talked to us. I can't tell you anything about the content of that conversation, except that he excused himself. And I was like, no, go. And he, all he did was put his stuff down in his car and then came back and talked to us more. Wow. It was incredible. We talked for like 10 minutes. That's remarkable. And he was lovely. So even in 1986, he wasn't so distant from it that... He he gave a shit. You know, he may have respected the fanship and what it means to people and was maybe just trying to distance himself in Hollywood because he wanted, you know, I mean, I, for that time, can maybe understand it, you know, because you're you're pigeonholed in playing that role. And what do I And there's not that many of that role. There's not that many of that role. (laughs) 
at all. Uh, Name another one. Liza Minnelli and Cabaret. It was already done. Right. Yeah, those are probably the two... <laughs> you're absolutely right. The two most similar performances. Well, it's, uh, you know what? Look at the makeup. Yeah. Look at Liza's two sets of eyelashes and Magenta's two sets of eyelashes. Sure. Yeah. Uh, the costume designer for Rocky, the film, she openly takes credit for the punk aesthetic post that film. I I mean, torn fishnets and brightly colored hair and yeah, even leather Early jacket. Madonna. I mean, I, you know, this was 75. Punk was just around the corner. Uh, I could absolutely see that. You know, I have a funny Barry Bostwick story. Um, my brothers met him. I have not gotten to meet him. What, what happened was I started doing local theater, and so I stopped being involved in the shadow cast as much. Uh, and my brother went on to play riff all, of, all over the country, actually, and he did mm. shock treatment the shadow cast and repo the genetic opera. They were doing the shadow cast for that film as well. Uh, and he's performed it here in New York, and I've gotten to see him as riff in New York. It was really, really special. But... Um, so Bostwick was in a Lifetime movie based on my grandma's uh, previous marriage. What? <laughs> he so the film is called Addicted to His Love, and um, it's very. I've seen it only once. Uh, it is on. Um, it might be on YouTube now. It is about a man who marries multiple women at the same time for their money, and. In reality, my grandma was one of the women that he that this man had married. With Polly Bergen. <laughs> I'm, 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 I got it now. You're looking oh, it up. Colleen Camp, I love her. Yeah. Um, wow. And Aaron Gray was. Uh, all right, Linda Pearl. God, all of these. Yeah. What year was this? What year? 80, Hold on. I don't remember. I've only seen it once. We weren't really... My dad was furious about it because he, you know, he was a young man when this happened to her. Uh, and, you know... 88, yeah. He wouldn't listen. He wouldn't talk about it. My grandma was on the Phil Donahue show uh, wow. talking about what this man did to her. And in the film, he... So in reality, he stole money from my grandma and her mother. In the film, the character that portrays her, it's her and her daughter. Okay. Um, and I can't remember which woman played her. But so anyway, I've always wanted to meet Barry Boswick so that I could tell him that. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> that he totally. played that role. I do think you'd get a kick out of it. He loves being part of Rocky. You know, Patricia Quinn. I just listened to a podcast episode where she's talking about shock treatment, actually. Mm. And it was it was really wonderful listening to her talk about um, she hadn't thought of the film for many years. And she didn't even watch it right before the podcast. And so all of these memories started coming to her. And it's really delightful hearing her oh, rediscover how much she loves it. It's um, Midnight Mass. It's Peach's Crisis, uh, Peach's Christ's podcast. She's a very famous uh, drag queen, influential in the horror world. Uh, Midnight Mass is the okay. podcast. Um, and, you know, Little Nell is what a storied career. I've heard she's nothing but wonderful. You know, it's a shame I haven't met I mean, they were both... They were both wonderful. I mean, they were both very much part of that of that uh, event, and they were both really wonderful. Pat Quinn, I will brag this till the day I die. Uh, so there were four of us singing, singing together, creating harmonies. Uh, Richard O'Brien was music directing us. Oh my god! Um, and like I said, we we rehearsed the 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 whole day before the night before. I think we got we started rehearsing the night before, and then throughout the day and uh, it was me and two other women and a, and a man he he died years ago uh, but it says four of us and I'm yeah, now I'm leaving names out of it because <laughs> things got, things were competitive yeah I'm telling you like the, preserving uh, people's <laughs> and I'm totally still in touch with everybody yeah uh, at least these anyway so but Pat who is known to be a lush. I don't know what she's doing these days, but was always had that reputation, and she, she maintained it. And <laughs> we were doing some harmonies, and she came up to us, and she put her arm around me, and she said, "Darling, you have the voice of an angel." And for all the details, I don't remember, boy. That one's coming with me. First off, <laughs> that was an incredible. Pat Quinn impression. <laughs> I literally don't know if I could do one for any other moment, but thank you. Well, and <laughs> like, second, you, you do have the voice of an angel. I've heard it oh, myself many you. times. It's always a treat. 
Thank Always you. a treat. Uh, do you have a favorite song in Rocky? <sighs> That's. It's so hard. I, I th- it is really hard. I, you know. I mean, it's it's some of it is like, well, which ones do you like to? Because we would do some real fun live singing from the back, right? So, yeah. so, so you know, uh, uh, I guess it's there's a light. I mean, I think for years it would have been. I mean, I love obviously you can't not love sweet tea and you can't yeah. not love the time warp and really the time warp is in a different the most indelible. <laughs> Go figure, uh, <laughs> it's timeless, but. Um, but I think it's There's a Light. Yeah, it's beautiful. It really is. And it. Um, I remember hearing uh, they, were, they weren't they were intending for that number to be that funny, but when audiences started laughing at the lyric over at the Frankenstein place, mm. they embraced it. You know, I mean, the movie's tongue-in-cheek and the movie's funny, but uh, it, I remember reading that that was a surprise laugh for Richard O'Brien, uh, that people found that particularly line just... uh, humorous. That I I had not heard that. That's yeah, very cool. and you know you're right. Sweet tea is and uh, any every time I hear the time warp, even if I don't go full out, I have to at least kind of do it a little bit, and no matter just where I am, bit. just a little bit. Uh, I I really love superheroes, and it, yeah, I, I I think did by you the guys time, have it? So by the, we did have it. We and so by the end of my time, we also had the cut that had added once in a while as well I didn't even know that existed yeah so it's production stills from the deleted scene I I don't believe that the full scene is available so it's stills with the song playing um it's I think it's the audio commentary where I'm getting all of these facts from because I had the the Rocky Horror Picture Show DVD where it uh, guaranteed to thrill you chill you and the DVD (laughs) menu had a pair of legs running around I I just remember it so specifically because I would dance around in my living room in high heels trying to learn the floor show routine or I I learned how to walk and dance in heels from Macaulay Culkin who had done Party Monster and said his advice to learn was to vacuum your house in heels because you have to go back and front and you have to pivot oh that's so smart yeah and it really worked Uh, so um, where was I? Oh, P- uh, Pat Quinn talking about Once in a While and what a beautiful song it actually is. And I've sung it, it at the piano bar. It's very lovely. Yes. But it was removed because it kind of stops the action. It works on stage. Brad gets that moment, you know, but in the film, it, you want that action to keep going. Um, it definitely works on stage. Um, I didn't I didn't even know Superhero. We, for years, we were the only, anytime I would see the movie anywhere else, there was no superheroes but there was that ending there was the like credits ending which we didn't have oh really we just it just ended different it didn't there's a I don't now I can't remember Wait, how so no let's talk about that because the UK release had superheroes mm-hmm. and then it came to America and it did not and then it was eventually re-released with superheroes added which I think is an important part of the film, you know, because it just shows Brad and Janet, they become almost like creatures, sexual creatures just crawling in heat on the ground, you know? But originally... But also, tattered. I mean, tattered. Th- nothing's it, left of them. They, I, they, one have, of my they favorite, have nothing but to rebuild. One of my favorite callbacks was uh, when Susan's... Her, I'm sorry, we don't say her name. When Janet <laughs> sings um, and superheroes come to feast, one of the callbacks was about how she looks like a reject from Cats. Because of nice. her makeup and her wig. <laughs> nice. Uh, yeah, you're absolutely right. Rebuild. The castle is gone. Their lives are upended. Yeah, they're they're fucked up. They are. <laughs> They'll never be the same. <laughs> um, yeah. I, so we didn't. So and then it just had a more normal movie ending with normal credits. It didn't have that like time warp music coming. But it didn't have. It didn't okay. ever go from like deep, dark, beautiful sad heartbreaking superheroes into like I can't uh, yeah. <laughs> like it just never but we never had, had that the, part you had the criminologist coming in right saying and crawling on the yeah, planet's, crawl, planet's yeah. face okay you had that and then it's yeah. just over and then it just probably went to like some more normal kinds of credits interesting like what, I guess whatever comes after that yeah that featured the with the features of like da 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 so and so is Columbia da, 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 whatever you yeah. know that's not that wasn't part of it interesting I wonder when yeah. that was added. Maybe the same time. I kind of think it, the but re-release happened. the other theaters happened. had that. Oh, they did. Yeah. Huh. So we must have had 
the you know the UK cut, I guess. I don't yeah, know. sure. Well, when the film was not originally a uh, hit. It was sent to college campuses, you know, advertised as a midnight double feature with uh, Phantom of the Megaplex. Is that what it's called? No, Phantom. Oh, oh God damn know. it. What's the, the 70s rock musical with Jessica Harper? Oh, I know this. Um, I don't. Yeah, you do. Hold on. My no. cat's biting me right now. Stop. <laughs> oh, I should have had this up. Uh, Phantom of the Paradise. I don't know this one. What? Okay, oh, well. You will love it. it, uh, it that one was 1974. Rocky was 75. Um, they're not the same film, but Jessica Harper stars in The right. Phantom of the Paradise, who would then go on to play Janet in Shock Treatment. That's right. Um, what a voice. I love Jessica Harper. Oh, what I a love voice. Her. I loved her. I mean, she's in the original Suspiria, and I love that she had a cameo in the remake. Uh, they brought her back. They called her and said, do you speak German? And she said, of course I do. And then she hung up and she immediately started learning German for the role that they offered her. <laughs> so here, here's the confession, Ricky. Is, I, I'm not a horror guy. I know. Yeah. <laughs> like, so when, I, don't, I don't know. I, you know, I've been thinking about it a lot, uh, just contemplating it as it's all over, you know, it's October, so it's everywhere. And then I'm doing your podcast and I'm like, I'm not ant like, Carrie came on the other night and I was riveted. I can't turn that off. Right. The original Carrie. And, you know, there it's not like there I it's slasher stuff. I don't know. I just never had a passion for it. Yeah. Um and I actually wanted to sort of touch on what Rocky Horror is. Um, and then maybe we can try to figure out how, why it happened in 1975. I so would love because that. what it it's a couple things, right? It's it's this it's this homage to, to mostly two different things. Mm -hmm. One being the classic horror film, the, the Frankenstein story. I mean, uh, if you watch Young Frankenstein, you can see so many things that are similar to Rocky Horror, like Terry Garr has a sequined top and they fuck on the slab and like yeah. there's just the and um and I, and I and it took me a long time to sort of figure out well that must really be derived from the source material somehow like yeah. somehow the source material must inspire similar things that these two movies it's not like they imitated each other you know they're they just were doing the same thing and then of course the old hollywood musical but also Clearly, Richard O'Brien was like a rock and roller guy. Mm -hmm. Like all that's a that is like some, and that's where the punk movement really started to come through as like more stripped down, like rock, like Buddy Holly style, but more ugly yeah. rock and roll. And you can hear that in in most of the chord structures, and you know, I mean, it yeah, it's, it's all over it. So I just think that's to so in the. In the world of like science fiction, we know that science that science fiction is often used to tell stories that you can't tell otherwise. Sure, it's just easier, right, to yeah. address to address societal issues through aliens. So now here we are, and it's Rocky Horror, but it's also camp. Like it's not, it's certainly not a movie that's taking itself seriously. To your point about over at the Frankenstein place. Um. I mean, one of my theories about why the uh, the floor shows. Okay, I gotta say this. I gotta like interrupt myself to just say, we were never a shadow cast. We were the floor show. Okay. I don't know if that was regional or if that was time. You know, so I don't know if I don't know what if they were called shadow casts across the country at that time. We never heard it. I never heard it until. Years and years later. Really? We, we were the floor I show. mean, we had a company name, Broadway Bound and Gagged. We did not. Huh. We were we were not that well organized. Later, later <laughs> it got more organized. After after, uh, Madman Mike, Madman Mike ran a tighter, much tighter floor show. Floor show again. Maybe they even called it a shadow cast yeah. by then. But it was like I had been gone for years and years, and then came back, and there was this thing called shadow cast. I was like, I mean, that makes sense, but what? Yeah. <laughs> but also, and I just want to say one more thing about the our floor show we were at the 8th Street Playhouse we could get away with a lot okay we had more inaccuracies and we didn't do the whole movie we did certain scenes and then sometimes if it was a special night and everybody was like do you want to we would do more scenes wow um but 
Um, and I will say in defense of that, but like you had people who didn't wear wigs, they just used their own hair with whatever color it was or wasn't. Yeah. Like we were a lot looser about uh, about that stuff. And I don't object to that. No. Like I, I have no problem with some creativity around the process. Um, especially since a lot of Franks do the, the, the show makeup rather than the film makeup. Uh, we that, always had film makeup. We always had, there was, uh, I think her name was Amanda, was our main Frank, and um, I don't I don't remember us getting along super well. And, I, I, well, I, and honestly, it's because <laughs> sure. I, wanted, I wanted to be Frank so bad. I got to go on for Frank once, and other than that, I was, you know, I was mostly a Transylvanian. Uh, my brother was Brad and Riff a lot. He, you know, uh, but I, with that particular... Brad and Riff are definitely two sides of the same yeah, coin. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I was, I should have been an Eddie... Uh, and I just never was, you know. Um, I would have now. Here. I would have liked to have been, but wait, where were we? <laughs> we were. I was talking about inaccurate. I was talking about uh, the creativity. Yeah. And what I wanted to say too is to go back to what I was saying about the not doing all the scenes. Is I got to tell you, I think that is a nicer experience for the audience because hmm. sometimes you need a rest and you can just sit back and watch the movie. Sure. Um, so we did musical numbers, mm-hmm. but we didn't do every fucking thing in between. Oh, we did. Yeah, we did. We did absolutely everything. But there were times that costumes were not as specific, and our cast our cast was pretty body positive. I remember seeing Rockies of all shapes and sizes and all genders. Um, the, I think again, we always had that also for some reason. Yeah. Um, well, it's, I mean, beyond how wonderful it is to be that embracing, it might be hard to find a bodybuilder who wants to hang out <laughs> as it's Rocky also, yeah. every night. And then once you accept that, then you, I think Rocky is in some ways the blankest canvas yeah, of a character, uh, sure. right? Well, there's not a lot to him uh, by design, right? Yeah. I, I mean, the, it, it, the actor who played him is now an antiques dealer. Like, he... <laughs> he is completely removed from it. It was rumored for years that David Bowie sang sort of Damocles, uh, which I can hear vocally, but uh, it's not him. <laughs> There's been a rumor for years that um, B.B. Newworth was actually Mike TV in the original Willy Wonka. Now, I will say that I think I started that rumor, and it's fully false, but it's really fun to try to figure out because you have moments where it could be true. That's hilarious. Go look. That's, oh my God. I'm imagining now and, jeez, oh, <laughs> what? <laughs> and his, like, she, the age is around, is around, is right-ish. And, um, and, and the actor's name is Mike The Men, T-H-E-M-E-N-N. Okay. If you were a girl playing a boy, not a bad <laughs> last name. That's exactly name. what your last name would be. It might not be Mike. I just said Mike because Mike TV. Mike I don't TV, know. Anyway, yeah. But it's Paris. Paris. Paris the Men. Totally oh. feels like a made-up name. Welcome to the stage, drag queen Paris the Men. <laughs> I mean, come on. That's what I'm saying. No, it's now, really fun. If you look, you could see it. But uh, I digress. What? We, uh, <laughs> were you, did your, uh, did your, did the floor show uh, mm. produ- <laughs> provide people with props, uh, audience no. members, or did people bring their own? People brought their own. Yeah. And we were probably less a prop heavy. Again, I, I don't know. We were a little different. We, like, we had, there were props, but I would run away for the rice. I mean, it was just so annoying, but, uh, but <laughs> not, yeah, it wasn't our biggest. There was some of it. Yeah. But we not would as sell, much. We would sell little, like, brown bags of, like, with rice and playing cards and toast and, um, there were no lighters allowed. Um, we would spray like spray uh, spray guns and, and water guns during the rain scene. We would and yeah, then we you would get a little you sure. would get a little piece of newspaper in with your your goodie bag too. But most people brought their own. Or you know, if you had come for many 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 years, you just kind of didn't do the props anymore. <laughs> that's I mean that's what I'm saying. Like that there was more of that. Yeah. There was definitely plenty of props but there was more of that right it was more like okay well we Some are, people are our, their props and our fine. company had a lot of trouble staying in one place i do remember that uh how i got uh into the cast was i was working it was one of my first jobs like i worked there in high school at a dollar movie theater 
um, you know, secondary theater movies who had been out for months, you go see it for a cheaper rate. And it was right. a really cool theater with neon lights everywhere and just an old, weird place. And the two guys who ran Rocky, uh, Matt and Ezra, came in. And Ezra, I mean, looks exactly like Richard O'Brien, spookily so, much mm. taller. Um, and we kind of, we recognized each other, you know? I didn't really know them super well yet. Uh, and so they were scoping out my theater. And I ran upstairs and talked to my manager, and he was not interested in having a bunch of weirdos <laughs> hanging out on the weekends, Just, making a mess. It's hard to staff, too. Yeah. And, make, and, and it's, you know, it's a mess. It's, it's hard to staff, and it's a mess. Yeah. And, it, and again, we were selling out. That was the heydayness of it, was that we sold out all the time. I mean, that's not what happens... Yeah, you know, well, we would go through phases. I remember selling out from time to time around, like, Mardi Gras or Halloween, you know, when we were doing special event shows or special theme shows, uh, we would sell out. But on, like, you know, a typical January 12th, you know, <laughs> it might not have been as as popular. Uh, but it was always interesting trying to figure out how to get around a theater, uh, running up and down aisles of varying degrees of Reiki. <laughs> <You Right. know? laughs> um, I never had a great Frank costume. I remember my very first one, I had a black t-shirt and they cut the sleeves off of it and that was my interpretation of Frank's. I mean, you do what you, d- you gotta do. Yeah, yeah. But now, you no. and I remember when the Rocky remake, the TV remake came out, you and I had a, a brief conversation about that. What did I say? Um, I said on Facebook, you know, it's not the worst thing I've ever seen, but there's nothing iconic about it. And you that commented, and you were like, "Yeah, that sounds about right." Yeah, it, it's I just, stand by. That I don't agreement. see. Yeah. I don't see any reason in ever remaking it as a film. Do it on stage and make it your own, you know. But as a film, I, there's a magic to it that there's no point in trying to recreate it. I, there, I mean, I keep thinking about like, what did I like about it, and, what, and sure, everything. I, I mean, you t- you sh- you talked about your relating to those lyrics. I I didn't do any of that. I just found the whole entire thing. First of all, you see the heel. He opens the door. Mm-hmm. You know, the door opens. He comes out. He opens the cape. Like every like, I. I melted, I died, and I've never been the same. Yeah. I remember my uh, my sister, that was not her. She's never been a Frank person. She was just a riffraff person. Interesting. Uh, which is interesting. Um, but, but the whole, like, you can analyze this film. Like I said, there's these different inspirations, these different sources. There's what it's trying to say and what it's trying to be. It's also, the one thing I'll add is it's also got a mythical quality. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not a myth expert. I think uh, there are comparisons to be made, but you, you're going into some kind of underworld. Mm-hmm. Time is all fucked up. Yeah. They sing about the time warp, warp. Then they go to the, you know, first there's a dance party. Then they go to the lab for the science experiment where, then there's a wedding. <laughs> then everybody goes to bed. Then it's dinner time. Sure. I have never thought of this. And then it's a floor show. <laughs> and then it's a floor show. Let's get ready for the floor show. Wow. I never so, thought of like how yeah. little sense that makes. That's my sister. I, I will have to say that's my my sister. Uh, Deborah Lip is, a, is an author and one of the one of her genre. She's done a lot of Wiccan writing. Cool. And and. uh I, I believe that this I never went to her talk but I think she did a talk that I just uh, stole without ever even hearing the talk just heard her tell me about the talk just now in 40 seconds I love that oh that's <laughs> it's so, brilliant though right it's, it's really smart I'd never considered it um, so it, all of that is to say you can look at the film because years ago I, years later I did I sat down and I watched it and I was watching it with a little kid and I was like oh this is upsetting and scary and weird and Frank's really mean you can you can analyze it you can wait step the by kid step the it. kid was saying that I started thinking you were, of it okay. watching through the eyes of the kid I was with okay um it was a little upsetting but 
fuck all that. Go back, you know, I'll just step it back to it's this experience. That's why it is becomes an experience. I started a sentence five minutes ago I didn't finish, which is part of the reason it becomes a floor show so readily and easily is because the dancing isn't very complicated. Not at all. That's the camp. Yeah. But I remember it to this day. <laughs> I remember step, 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 kick. It's just the yeah. easiest thing, you know? But it, I, it was so much. We would have the entire cast, Transylvanians and everybody, come up on stage for the floor show. Uh, oh, it, uh, But it's like this film is this magical experience. You walk into this film and you are in a world. And there have been other films that I've had that experience with, but not to this degree. And then it became this bigger experience and you walk into the theater and that's that's a world yeah like it's all a world absolutely and in 1983 they were telling me it you missed it kid it's over and in 2000 and something I looked around and I'm like I don't know I think you guys missed it it's over and we were all wrong anybody who dared say that is wrong completely it exists the, it is the longest running film that is still in circulation when Fox was acquired by Disney um, you know, they were locking up a bunch of Fox's films to put on, you know, their own streaming platforms, and they made an exception for Rocky Horror to mm. keep it out there for the public. And I, that's surprising to me because I love Disney, but they're a terrible, evil company. They're not usually so public service oriented. No, no. <laughs> but this is not. a public service. <laughs> and you know, it's you talk service. about Frank being mean, and I mean, he's a brat. He is just the nar. I mean, he's people, a bully. People overuse the word narcissist, but he's a narcissist. He is a bully. You know, uh, he's likable because of his performance. If you get the wrong performer in that role, it's not. It's like the first time I saw Rent, I hated the character Maureen. Be- and I, I firmly blamed the actress who was playing her because then the next several times I saw it, Maureen grew on me. You know. Um, yeah, Maureen's tough. Ma- I could see. Yeah, you know, she's uh, it's or every time you watch the last five years, either one of them can be an uh, insufferable asshole, or they can really be, you know, endearing and relatable. Uh, and it, it takes a strong Frank. Now, if you see a live production of the stage show, do you want someone to make completely different choices with Frank, or do you want Tim Curry on stage, or something in between? Well. If if you, uh, mm. so I I have an opinion that I'm gonna that I formed a long time ago based on experience that I will tell you in two seconds. Mm-hmm. But I'm kind of like disclaimering the fuck out of it because yeah. I don't know how it holds up today. Got it. When I saw it on Broadway, we foolishly purchased our tickets on Pride. That's how New Jersey I was. Okay. We didn't know. We didn't think. We didn't plan. So there were a lot of understudies. Um, we didn't get to see Leah Delaria as Eddie mm-hmm. slash Dr. Scott. Yeah. And the and it was the original, I can't think of his name, but I can picture him, beautiful man who was playing Frank. Uh, he was the original when it came back to Broadway. Not Terrence Mann. Not Terrence Mann, who is, who is Tim Curry. Who but. is Tim Curry. <laughs> We get, every generation gets one. Now we've got Christian Borle. But, um... Uh, uh, Tom anyway. Hewitt. Tom Hewitt. Terrence Mann took over for him. I did not know that. Yeah, that would have been amazing. Yeah, yeah. That you know, would have been Alice amazing. Ripley was in it. Raul Esparza. I mean, that was a great cast. Joan Jett. Incredible. It was incredible. Yeah. Uh, it wasn't Joan Jett when I saw it. By the time I saw it, I've met her. She was a terrible person. Oh, no. To us. Uh, it, it was uh, Anna Gasteyer. Oh, and she came out and she man. played the violin. They just had them do whatever they did that was good, right? Well, I love great. that Sally yeah. Jesse Raphael played the criminologist at one point. Oh, I love that. It's so good. But here's what I was going to say. So Terrence, uh, not Terrence Mann. Now I can't. Tom Hewitt. Tom Hewitt. I'd already seen him. You know, he'd been on the talk shows or the Tonys or whatever. I'd yeah. seen his, you know, clips of his performance. Again, this was back when we didn't have a YouTube and we didn't, clips were not so accessible. Um... And he was more, if anything, more mask than Tim Curry yeah. did it. But in in that vein, and the person I saw as the understudy, uh, I will not name because he's a perfectly good performer and uh, people know him because he's 
that level of where people might know him personally. And but he and and he was very much more. Again, I'm going to use some old language. It's mm-hmm. not the worst. Yeah. It's not the worst. Skinny street queen. Okay. Skinny, trashy, a little bit, right? And that was the vibe. And I'm watching it, and I'm trying, and I'm. I was like, okay, open mind, mm-hmm. boom. Let's let's watch this transvestite again, language, uh, be interpreted this way because it's valid. And then I was like, yeah, no, he's got to be. Uh, he's got to be masculine enough. And again, this is the opinion I formed then, and I'm willing to be challenged on it today. But yeah. it was like, he's got to be masculine enough to seduce a man who's never given it much of a thought, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> and, a, and, a, and a virgin away from her fiance. Yeah. He's got to be that level of appealing to everybody. Yeah. And I didn't see the street queen as having that. Well, so I- there's. Yeah, something that has to be there. Of course, and then from there, interpret. I see Dom in the. Or I'm sorry, I see Frank in the bedroom <laughs> as like a Dom bottom. You know, he's like a bossy bottom. I, I mean, uh, yeah, or yeah, at yeah, least yeah. like a versatile bottom because I'm sure he could top too. But I think you know, I, I. Well, and then he comes out whipping, whipping, riffraff, right? In a which is maybe the hottest thing in there if you set aside that it's non consensual. You know what I mean? Like it's. Totally, totally. There's a lot that going on in this into, movie. Honestly, I, I, Planish Man at Janet might be my favorite song in the film, besides the the, and I don't know why. I think because it's it might be the most musical theater like story driving, mm. uh, singing to each other kind of song. You know, uh, I, I I remember there was um I was in high school the Rocky Horror Punk Rock Show was an album that was released and it was, uh you know early aughts punk bands covering the Rocky Horror, uh, picture show album. And Tsunami Bomb sang that song, and my high school was obsessed with them. They weren't a big deal. I, you know, they didn't really go anywhere. But to see them on that album singing that song, I was really, really into it. I loved that album. The the cover had like the Rocky lips, like what's on my shirt, but they were all pierced up. Uh, it was nice. uh, it was cool. I had to I had to order it in the mail. It wasn't even online. Um, God, I, I wish I could get my hands on that now. I'd love to listen to it again. <laughs> I I would love to hear it. I've never heard it. I'll look for it. I'll try to find it. <laughs> Have you seen? Uh, is it? Um, is it Mason Alexander, who's um, from the Sandman and from many other things? A tra- this is a trans person, Mason Allen Mason Alexander Park, uh, who I have only just discovered from watching the Sandman, um, is this incredibly stunningly talented trans person? Yeah. Uh, really beautiful 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 and um and they played Frank and I'm, there's there's yeah there's clips of that definitely that's a performance not to be missed I'm looking at pictures right now and it's ridiculous she looks fucking incredible I mean she always yeah, looks and, great so those are striking and, like features you know yeah now that counters what I just said all right, that's a Frank I I can buy into. Yeah. So it's a delicate it, conversation to have, but I don't think it's an impossible one. I think of in the Hellraiser remake that just came out, Jamie Clayton is a trans actress who's playing the iconic Pinhead. Mm. And on its surface, it could be looked at as stunt casting. I don't think it is. I think if you know the text the hellbound heart that this film is based on the Cenobites are described as um, like unrecognizable human entities right and I think that this I'm trying to word this delicately so that it does not come off the wrong way Jamie Clayton approached this role knowing that no one else could have brought what she has to bring to it and yeah, I think I mean, that you look at Frank and, you know, it, uh, and, and a performer specifically like Mason Alexander Park and the tone of voice that she has and her pattern of speech. I mean, it's iconically Frank. Look, she's, I mean, go look at her in The Sandman. She's playing Desire. Yeah. Right? This is a person who is 
sexy to anyone yeah. and everyone. And that's what Frank needs to be. That's what Frank be. needs. You're absolutely so, right. So, uh, you know, I can update my my language to my opinion, but my opinion is still hanging in there. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it just has to be it's not as it's not as gender norm based as I I thought because I will I mean if they ever redo it again. See, there you go. Laverne Cox, fantastic performer, did not have a, didn't not not fantastic enough. Not Frank. Just not, not a Frank. not a Frank. Yeah. And I think that that felt more like stunt casting casting Laverne Cox at that time because I can think of a million other actors who might have approached it and done, you know, a better job. She yeah. she she wasn't awful. She's just not Frank. You know, no one in that film was... Maybe Adam Lambert as Eddie, but even Adam Lambert isn't punk and edgy enough to to play Eddie, you know? He's, it's, I mean, it's also I, stunt I like casting. Him. It's stunt casting. Eddie, Eddie is... Eddie is gross in the best possible way. Yeah. You know, I mean, and again, you can reinterpret that. You can change it. You can make it something different. But I, I don't think. But Adam Lambert is stunt casting. Yeah, he's too pretty. You know, God, he's all, pretty. He. I met him once, and he told pretty. me that he liked. <laughs> I met him once, and he told me that he liked my eyeliner. Aww. And then we broke up. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I just broke up with him in my head for you. Oh, How dare he? Yeah, he's over. <laughs> we're done. Well, we're kind of approaching the uh, the. You know the midnight hour. The midnight hour, hour, and uh, <laughs> I would, you know, I'd love to kind of start to close up with just some final anything that you didn't get off your chest that you'd love to talk about. My goodness, I talked a lot, I, and I bounced all over, and I feel like I covered a lot, and we covered a lot, and you shared some really beautiful stories of what it meant to you. I think I didn't. I think I didn't talk about what it meant to me in some ways because I'm not as clear. Um. It definitely, you know, again, I, 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 talk, I, I talk about what was wrong socially with it. And I always grappled. I, I, so I lived on both sides of things where in some ways I learned to really express myself in ways that I, I don't know where I would have anywhere else. I mean, I really, I really didn't see myself as sexual. And then I, I sequined my bra and let it show and let myself look beautiful and let myself ooze like magenta oozes. Yeah. Um, and in other ways, I was intimidated and uh, never felt up to anybody's standards there. Not as a performer, but as a freak participant. Right. And then, and sexually, I was still, I think, not, I hadn't, hadn't there was a lot I hadn't worked out. So, I don't know. I just know that, um, And it meant the world to me, the world to me. And it means less to me now, except for what it meant to me then. Mm. And I, I honor what it meant. It doesn't pull me the same way now. Yeah. Um, but you wouldn't like it's be where com- you are now complete. without it then. I would not. And it's like it's complete for me. Like, every, everyone, there's a lot of like, hey, let's get a, get together and let's this and let's, and I, I did a bunch of that and then I'm like, no, I'm good. Like, yeah. I'm good. Like, I, I have my friends from there, but. You know, so, but like I, I, I said, I think, I think the best part of it is that anytime anybody says it's over and you miss the best of it, we are wrong because anytime anybody discovers it is just like when you discovered it and when I discovered it. Yeah. It's because the magic is there because it's. Yeah, it's really eternal. It's really there's nothing like it. There's nothing. There's nothing like it. There never will be. There's not. There's things like it, but there's not. There's <laughs> nothing. No, that's you know. exactly right. You know, it it challenges um, the norms without challenging the norms. It's not a presentation of a challenge. It is just a world where sex is fluid. And I mean, truly give yourself over to absolute pleasure. And that is what happens in this film. Now, of course, there's murder and, you know, there's sure, 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 sure. Cannibalism. And, and cannibalism and, and some consent issues. Sure. You know, sure. Um, um, but it's not, I, get, I think what, I think what you're, it's not it's not meant I mean I was going to say it's not meant to be a message movie except it's hard to say that right after give yourself over to absolute pleasure but like that's the message the rest of it isn't it isn't about it isn't telling it's 
it isn't trying to be, I hate to say this because this sounds so right wing, but it isn't trying to be woke. Yeah, no, I, I get it. And I don't, there's nothing wrong with being woke. I, I'm so tired know, of people know, saying that. But I mean, um, it isn't, it isn't, it isn't. No, it's unapologetic. Trying to impose anything. It's unapologetic. It's just like, here's what we're doing. And you know we're what? We're just hanging out and fucking uh, for, Especially for 1975, it's a queer movie made for queer people. This film was not made with straight audiences in mind at all. And I have to applaud and commend that because it's effective and, you know, most of it, if not, in my opinion, I mean, most of it holds up today. The only couple things that, in my opinion, have aged poorly, I embrace them because it's a part of my upbringing. And, you yeah. know, this film has meant so much to so many people for decades now. I want to know what it's going to mean moving forward for people, you know? And um, and I, I would love to hear, you know, more opinions from maybe younger folk who are discovering it now. You know, there's still an interest. It still plays here in New York. I haven't been to the Shadow Cast in a number of years. I work Fridays and Saturdays now, so I can never make it. Um, but, you know, there's a Shadow Cast. There's a floor show in my heart at all times, <laughs> and especially around Halloween, you know, because it's a special time of year for Rocky. It's just, it's the time of year when it pops up in the mainstream. And, totally. And you can, you can There's tell who... performances of your, it all over. Yeah, and, yeah. yeah. And you, and you can tell and that it's still recognizable because people react to it still. Even people who aren't fans, they know what it is. Even if they haven't seen it, it's just present. Um, and that's what I have to say about the Rocky Horror Picture Show. Well, well done. I want to thank you, Roberta. And I want to let everyone know Roberta uh, is a podcaster herself. Uh, Roberta is the co-host of a fabulous podcast. Why don't you tell us about They Coined It? Yeah, uh, I host, uh, I produce and co-host a podcast called They Coined It, a Mad Men podcast. That is the entire name I made sure <laughs> so that it would be, it would not uh, drop off in SEO. Um, yeah, if you're a Mad Men fan, uh, come on over. Uh, we go episode by episode. Uh, I did a lot of writing about Mad Men in real time. And then this uh, was my COVID project, and it's become, you know, it's, it's, we've got a nice following, and, and we just got the best review I've ever seen about like that Matt Weiner should go make more seasons so that we don't ever have to stop doing our podcast, which was just so lovely. Well, I would love that um, for Mad Men fans and fans of your podcast. <laughs> right. Yeah. There's that. Um, and thank you, Ricky, because I, as a podcaster now, uh, for a few years, I'm like, why hasn't anybody asked me on a podcast to talk about Rocky Horror? So oh my <laughs> I was God, so no. excited. In instantly. I'm so, <laughs> so glad you were open to do this. When I contacted Roberta and you started reading that paragraph I sent you, you were like, I'm not a horror fan. What the hell does he want? <gasps> oh, oh, Rocky. Yeah, okay. October, <laughs> sure. Good idea. Ricky, yeah. treat tea. Yes, yeah, of course. Yeah. Here we are. Uh, yeah. Would you like people to follow you on social media? You don't have to. Uh, yeah, what am I? Am I Roberta Lip on Twitter? I'm definitely TCI Madmen. Wait, what the hell am I? I, <laughs> I say it all the time on our podcast, but I usually read it. I'm going to check right now, Ricky. All right, while you Good. do that, I'll Good. give you my stats. <laughs> if you want to follow uh, Rick or Treat Horrorcast on social media, on Instagram and Twitter, it's just Rick or Treat Pod. If you want to follow me, your host, Ricky, uh, it is Instagram at Rick, the letter R, treat, and on Twitter uh, at Rick, the letter R, tweet. And you can check out my uh, reviews. I write reviews for films and television for the website spoilerfreereviews.com. I'm a contributor, and I'm happy to be so. Please check out this website. Uh, I think it's really cool that you can read what we have to say and not get anything spoiled. That's awesome. It is. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to check that out. So I am, in fact, Roberta Lip on Twitter. Uh, if you like uh, a little bit of Mad Men, my cat, and politics, uh, that's what you'll find there. And then uh, <laughs> both at Twitter and, um, where is it? At Twitter, I just lost it. I just clicked on the wrong. At Twitter and Instagram, it is, no, where's my profile? TCI? 
TCI Mad Men Pod. I was right. Okay, so it's at TCI Mad Men Pod. Uh, I think we're on Facebook too, but I don't pay much attention to that account, so or maintain it. Twitter and Instagram is where you can follow the podcast. The podcast again, they coined it a Mad Men podcast. Uh, you can find it by that name wherever you find your podcasts, and uh, most people are pretty happy with it. Start at the pilot. That's where people start. Yeah, I actually want to re- we rewatch the show and follow your podcast along with it. Um, we have, yeah. we keep it spoiler light. And if you've never watched Mad Men, yeah. we keep it mostly spoil spoiler free. We're not pristine because sometimes we make mistakes. Sure, because <laughs> it gets confusing. Uh, but for the most part, we are spoiler light. If you if you've never watched Mad Men, which is currently on uh, Free V, which you can get through Prime, um, and and a lot of people are doing rewatches with us. That's amazing. So. Oh, I love that. Well, speaking of watching as a podcast goes along, next week, uh, a couple dear friends of mine and I will be discussing the 1978 original Halloween directed by John Carpenter. None of these sequels, which I do love a lot of them, Uh, but you're going to get our first impressions of the new Halloween ends, and then we're not going to talk about it for the rest of the episode. It'll all (laughs) just be that film, and I can't wait for you all to join us. Thank you very much, Roberta, for joining. Thank you so much it was very much my absolute pleasure see what I did there <laughs> that was great it was great you did it you brought us all the way around full circle and then I wrecked it <laughs> <laughs> all right um I, I want to get it I want to hang out with you let's let's grab coffee soon let's do it I miss you all right bye you. everybody Wrong. later spookies Wrong.